Hello, it's Scott Manley here, is still in Hawaii, at a place called the end of the world, which, well, I'm sure it's pretty apocalyptic when there's some serious waves, but it's pretty chill right now. So yeah, a few things have been going on in space that I probably should talk about just because they're interesting. First of all, we had a, well, a launch that was actually quite a surprise. It came onto our calendars only a couple of months ago. Uh, the US uh, Department of Defense launched a satellite on a Pegasus XL rocket. And I have previously declared the Pegasus XL dead. So you might think, wait a second, I thought you said it was dead. And, you know, there is, well, there is some question as to the future of Pegasus XL because it is still very overpriced. As it happens, the Department of Defense got this at a bargain basement price. I would, some would say a going out of business price because these were Pegasus that had been built for the Strato launch project and, of course, had never flown. But what's interesting is that this launch of a, like a, a payload was put together in a very short time. The payload was built inside of a year and they, to demonstrate rapid relaunch capabilities, they didn't tell the launch provider when it was going to be launched until like a month or so before the actual launch. But apparently Northrop Grumman, who now owns Pegasus, it was originally built by Orbital, which merged with ATK to be Orbital ATK, and now it's part of Northrop Grumman. So it, it may be, maybe there's a future for the Pegasus uh, since they've demonstrated this rapid launch capability. Having said that, there is only one other Pegasus sitting in storage right now. Now equally, there was another launch which is actually somewhat related. Again, a Northrop Grumman launch to the Department of Defense. And this has a really cool badge, uh, like showing like a, it, it reminds me of Porco Rosso. It's like a warthog with a flying mustache and stuff. Department of Defense, NRO badges, always the best. Let me tell you, oh, it's perfect. But yeah, they, this was launched on a Minotaur 1. And the Minotaur 1, if you don't know, it uses the first two stages of a Minuteman missile. Now, I think this is a Minuteman 1, and those were deployed from 1962 to 1965, right? Very long time ago. And then they were decommissioned, but the boosters are still around. Some of them have been kept in storage so they can be used as launch vehicles. And so this booster that launched this payload a few days ago may well be the oldest rocket to ever fly, as in time between it actually being built and flying, obviously, the R7-derived uh, stuff that the USSR and Soviet Union use, and, and, and sorry, and Russia, pardon me, use, <laughs> is, is, has its roots going back to the 1950s. But this is actually a piece of hardware dated probably from the 60s. Which, it just blows my mind. There is like a, a Minotaur C, incidentally, which uh, is the commercial version that uses a first stage which is based on an ICBM, but not actually derived from an ICBM. The second and third, oh, the, by the way, the, the Pegasus link is that the second and, four, uh, sorry, the third and fourth stages of the Minotaur are the top two stages of the Pegasus. Now, the reason why this isn't seen more often is I think in the, maybe the late noughties, early noughties, late nineties, this was developed and Orbital Sciences wanted to expand the capabilities and they basically, Congress said you can use these Minuteman missiles for launching payloads into orbit, but you're only allowed to do it for government payloads. And Congress wouldn't allow them to expand that for commercial operations. So when they created the Minotaur C, or as it was once known, the Taurus, they had to build their own first stages. And so that kind of robbed it of its capabilities, of its uh, cheapness, let's say. Anyway, I'm sure we'll see Minotaur consider, cons, uh, continuing to fly because there's a lot of those Minuteman stages in storage, right? Anyway, anyway, the other sort of really big stuff that's going on right now is like the Global Space Exploration Conference. It's basically a giant space exploration conference that's going on right now in St. Petersburg, Russia. And the sort of big, th while it's had leaders from all of the major space agencies there, either virtually via, you know, giving talks via Zoom or video conferencing, or actually physically there, the thing that I've seen most interesting out of this has been China and Russia. Russia's basically had Dmitry Rogozin on day one saying, we are going to work very hard with other partners, specifically China. We want to launch our Soyuz to the Chinese space station, Tiangong. 
And <laughs> that's going to be an interesting one because they're going to have to get buy-in from uh, the European Ariane space who have the only Soyuz launch facility which is at low enough longitude or latitude to actually reach the Chinese space station. Chinese space station is about 42 degrees north. Uh, Baikonur is 45 degrees, but has problems with dropping debris on Mongolia. Um, and, ah, uh, shoot, what's it called? Ah, Vostoshny. Vostoshny is about 52 degrees north or 51 and something. So, <laughs> so basically, if Russia wants to work with China and launch stuff to their space station, they're gonna have to get the European Space Agency and Ariane Space to get on their site. And they might well do that because Europe also wants to be involved in another space station project. Uh, another side of this is the Soyuz, when it was being worked on for the ISS, they kept on using the old style Soyuz docking adapter because the new APAS, Androgynous Peripheral Attachment System, that Russia invented, let's remind us, um, it was too heavy to operate on the uh, Soyuz and have enough margin for operation. But that was 20 years ago. Since then, there's been a lot of upgrades to the Soyuz. So they might be able to fly these with the uh, docking system, which is suitable for China and fly them from Kourou in you know, South America and be able to be part of this project. But look, that's a small thing. The big thing is that they are actually talking big time about a China-Russian uh, international lunar research base. And this is a base on the surface of the moon. The timeline they're talking about is for the next five years or so, continue doing reconnaissance in collaboration between both countries and then move to start actually building out structures on the surface that can eventually support landings in 2035. So the diagrams, they, they've got nice slides and stuff and they show, you know, long march rockets flying alongside Soyuz to launch payloads initially. And then it's like, Angara and uh, Long March 8 or 9 or whatever launching. Oh, Long March 9? I don't know. Big heavy lift vehicles. Uh, Long March 5 actually as well. Launching stuff to the surface of the moon and eventually putting people on the moon. Now, let's be clear. These timelines are highly aspirational, right? <laughs> There's a lot of money involved here. Certainly, they are looking for other partners to collaborate with them. They would be very happy to have JAXA or European Space Agency also collaborate. Um, but building something like that in this amount of time may not be possible, especially since it's not even clear that the Chinese heavy lift rockets will be ready for the construction phase. But having said that, you know, the fact that they're committed, they put this out there, is a really, really cool thing. And I'd, I'd, I'd like to see it eventually succeed, whatever the time scale. I, very likely that the US with Artemis will return to the moon first. But the question is always, how long are they going to stay? How much of a commitment is this to like long term exploitation and exploration of the moon? Uh, there was a few different launch sites that were shown uh, over the surface of the moon. Most of them were at low latitude, but one was in Amundsen Crater at the South Pole, I believe. Yeah. So anyway, that's uh, what's going on. Oh, and also, of course, with a, a launch, well, practically hours away, China have finally announced the crew for their, uh, for their first flight to their space station. And because I'm doing this from memory, I don't actually remember their names. So I'm going to like edit in a thing over the top to show you, but three Chinese astronauts. I know they're all male and they're all, two of them have previously flown to space on Shenzhou. Well, third, it's going to be his first flight and they're going to spend several months on the space station, their space station, including an EVA to demonstrate the capabilities and hopefully, you know, move their construction forward because, you know, this is a modular space station, unlike Tiangong 1 and 2. This is going to be require uh, actual unpacking of materials, ex new deployment of stuff, etc etc also today there was a spacewalk on the iss to start installing the new irosa the improved rollout solar arrays they didn't complete all their tasks they had a few problems in fact they did have a problem with one of the spacesuits and you know those spacesuits that are on the space station are starting to show their age i mean they've been they were built decades ago and they're being refurbished so 
it's not it's not uncommon to find problems with them. Hopefully, by the time that uh, US is landing people on the moon, they will have newer spacesuits to to do that in because. Yeah, the ones that are are used in space don't are, are kind of heavy. They're kind of bulky. They're not really the kind of things you want to walk in. The legs don't actually move well enough for that. So anyway, yeah, from the end of the world, this is Scott Manley saying, fly safe. Mm-hmm.